Well, it's always uh, exciting and adventurous, and you kind of go into the unknown when Patrick Doyle's <laughs> in the house. It's kind of like Star Wars, you know? You're just not sure it's somewhere this frontier out there. Oh, come on, man. I'm so consistent. I'm it's trying to abuse you emotionally. Am I working? Is it working? <laughs> not yet. All right. Keep I don't want to make, make light of a very serious topic, yeah. but uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we got to keep a little... Life levity. and levity going on here. Uh, Patrick Doyle's in the house. Uh, he's with Veritas Counseling. We can take your calls today. Uh, the number is 776-5368. And if you want to join the conversation, you're more than welcome to join us. He's going to be with us the whole hour. And uh, if you want to remain anonymous, we'll respect that request as well. We won't put your <coughs> name on the air because we know that these topics can be a little sensitive. That's right. Emotional abuse. Uh, you know, I had uh, a Dr. Savage on yesterday. Okay. He's in the town uh, visiting, and we were talking about um, kind of working up to this. And he was dealing with stress, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the effects of stress on our life, mm -hmm. and those uh, things in our lives that we know that there's something deep down in there, but we never deal with it. Yep. You mm -hmm. know, and how that produces stress and anxiety. Yep. Absolutely. Now, let's add a little emotional abuse to the mix. <laughs> well, if you want to have a stressful life, live in an emotionally abusive relationship. Yeah. I mean, you so know how many millions do? A lot. And, and here's the reason why I bring this up, Perry, is that within the church, I think this is um, more prevalent. Really? Because there, I'll explain why I think that is. But first, just let, let, me, let me differentiate emotional abuse from physical abuse, okay? So if somebody comes in the room and they smack me in the face, um, I get a black eye, that's going to be real easy to um, understand what happened. Mm -hmm. Right? Everybody's mm -hmm. like, oh, they hit you, that's wrong. They shouldn't do that. I mean, that's, that's an easy one. But if somebody is behind closed doors saying things to me that no one knows about, and I can't prove, hmm. and so that he person... Said, we said, or he said, she said yeah, type of thing? And, yeah, and the person that's saying it has a good reputation among people because they, they put up a good front, but behind closed doors they're, they're verbally mean, and, or they're isolatory, or they're, they're, they don't say anything, they seethe. There's all kinds of ways. So when I'm talking about emotion, emotional abuse, I'm, I'm talking about on an emotional level, you feel hurt, you feel afraid, you feel intimidated, you feel unloved, you feel neglected. And I'm talking about this mostly in the context of marriage. All right. Now, uh, you can tell this is going to be a pretty sensitive topic. And again, if you want to join us, you're welcome to 776-5368. Two points of this I want to put on the table first. Okay. The intentional and the unintentional. Okay. And because right. you, you get them, I get them. Mm -hmm. And I get a little ticked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it okay for Christians to get ticked? It's, an, it's a necessary is evil. Yeah. Did Jesus get upset? Yes, he did. He turned tables over. Yeah. He got upset. Okay. Uh, I yeah. just wanted to make sure well, I'm on the... <laughs> I, I, like, I like how Eugene Peterson translates that passage about anger. He's, the way Eugene Peterson translates it, he says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. Yeah, just but, don't sin. But don't let your anger be used for revenge. Okay, good point. <clears throat> um, I guess I what I get upset about is we Christians get accused of hypocrisy. Yeah. And you know what? We deserve it sometimes. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Because there's a lot of hypocrisy that's yes. out there. And one is that people that do put on the spiritual front mm -hmm. and in, be in their personal lives, there's this other thing going on. Yes. Uh, hello, let's right. blow the whistle and get this thing done, straightened out here. Exactly. So with emotional abuse, what I see most of the time is that um, the person has the worst case scenario. The, the scenarios that I see that are the worst are is they there is a husband who and I've seen this multiple times. So I'm not I'm not trying to make this be this way. It's just no. what I've seen so many times. The husband has a very good reputation among people in the church. He may even be a leader. He may do service work. He may be involved in some sort of ministry. <clears throat> but at home, he's he's neglectful. He doesn't take responsibility for his actions. He never repents. He's verbally mean, or he doesn't say anything. He does. He just. He just completely rejects the person, disregards them, <clears throat> and the person. How did that happen? <clears throat> we'll get to that. So, <laughs> so here's what happens. If you, one of the ways you can tell you're in this situation is is you start to feel like you're losing your mind, because here's what happens when you're with somebody who never takes responsibility for their actions, you start to feel a little crazy. Yeah. 
Okay, because you're like, I'm pretty sure there's a problem. But then you go talk to them like, oh, no, that wasn't me. And oh, no, you and because and that's not why. And you should have. And the Lord said and because you shouldn't because, you know, but that's why. And the next thing you know, you're like, what is going on? Yeah, I, I <clears> just, just lost my mind. Exactly. So you, you feel uncertain. You feel lonely. You kind of start to feel hopeless. You feel like the, you feel like you can never get any resolve to anything. Okay. One of the most clear indications of somebody who's unsafe is that they never take responsibility for their actions. Hmm. Now you look at the scripture and you have God instructing us to confess our sin, to take the log out of our own eye. If we know that our brother has something against us for us to go make it right with him. The Bible always puts the responsibility on the offender to move forward toward the offended. Okay? Mm -hmm. If somebody never takes responsibility, that's not humanly possible. The only person that could have done that was Jesus, and they, he's not here. He's mm -hmm. in heaven with God. Mm -hmm. So no one's perfect enough not to need to take responsibility. So if you're with someone who never takes responsibility, that's a clue. Now, what you said is the people who don't take responsibility generally have so much intact denial mm -hmm. that they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So well, I, I tell you, I, all of a sudden you just have better conversation with Walter. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in recovery, we have this thing called, you know, it's an acronym for denial. Didn't even know I was lying. <laughs> really? Yeah. So you can, somebody can be so self, so self-deceived that they believe the rhetoric the lie, the denial, the rationalizing, the minimizing, the justifying, the spiritualizing, they believe it. That's why they're so convincing. All right. And that's what I've always come <clears> up <throat> with. Sometimes you can't make sense of nonsense. Exactly. You may be losing your mind. Right. Uh, but maybe you're not. No. And yeah. so this is why what I see in these situations is so here's what I see overarchingly. So then the, the, the wife of this person is struggling. So she goes to a Christian friend. And then they get the advice, love them more. Yeah. Be kind, be loving, and they'll come around. Well, I can tell you right now that if somebody has that much denial and they're being that harmful, loving them more will only embolden them to take more ground and be more mean in their kind sort of way. Really? Yes. Now, how we, do they interpret that? So what's going on in their brain? When, when you start being nice, they, real, they figure you realize what's going on. They figure you finally came to your senses, and now you're going to do it their way, which is the right way, obviously, because that's the only way there is. Uh, right? So I think. <laughs> because they're, they're, they're so de their denial is so thick, they believe it. Yeah. And if you took anybody from, you know, with, with any sense and looked at the circumstance, the person looking at the circumstance would go, that's not all right. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they can convince you. And, and you know, I can, uh, I've worked in uh, treatment for a long time. So I've done, a, I've worked in residential drug and alcohol treatment. And so I've seen some of the best manipulator liars that I think have ever lived. And I lived with one <laughs> as my, my father. Mm -hmm. So while my father had a very, everybody respected him and loved him and, and liked him at home. Mm. Nobody respected, liked, or loved him. Everybody was afraid of him, you know. And so you, people can have this very clear duplicity. And I think what happens in the church is we give some really bad advice. Instead of bringing all this stuff to the surface and starting to walk through it, which is going to be a painful mm -hmm. and dangerous process, we just want the victim, in this case, the one who's being manipulated, to go back and be nice. Well, that's not going to work. And I think the most loving thing we could do for the person who's in denial is to cause them pain in such a way that they might repent. Because if they go on in their denial, where's that going to lead them? All right, so there's a fine line in, I mean, I guess uh, it's often been said, this is tough love. Yes. Uh, you're not talking about abandonment here. You're just no. talking about drawing a line. Yes, I'm talking about drawing a line, and I'm talking about, listen, <laughs> somebody, I've never told anybody in denial the truth, Perry, and had them go, oh, gee, thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you, you made sure there was a door for you to run from. Right? Yeah. Well, I remember, one, I remember one time when I was working in residential treatment at yeah. Genesis before it closed, and mm. there's a guy that came in, and you know he was in major denial. And we we're in a group therapy session, and you know I went around the room, and everybody's talking, and I went to him, and he's like his second group, and I'm like, oh, you want to tell us your story? He's like, no, I don't want to talk. Leave me alone. And I'm like, okay, and we kept talking, and I came back to him, hey, you want to talk? He's like, no, I said I don't want to talk now. Leave me alone, and I got 
a little, you know, like, well, we'll see. Yeah. And so I just kept pushing him. And next thing you know, I'm on the ground and he's on top of me. Really? And he said, he's, he's you know, straddling my chest. <laughs> he said, I told you. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, okay, you don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So my point is, is that when somebody's in denial and you tell them the truth, usually what you get is a reaction. Yeah. You don't get, oh, okay. Now I see it. Yeah. Okay, what happens is, it's, and here's my strong belief, conviction from God via the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is what changes things. Yeah, yeah. But if somebody's comfortable, have you ever been convicted when you're comfortable? No, no. So in a relational, marital relationship, as, as, as somebody comes to us and they're saying, you know, I really feel confused, I feel... Now, can there be situations where people are pathological and there's, you know, a situation yeah. where somebody's been abused and they're hallucinating? Yeah, but that is like one half percent, mm -hmm. okay? The vast majority is there's really something going on. And as, as uh, brothers and sisters, I think part of what our job is, is is to bear the burden, get our shoulder under the plow, and help that situation. Because what I see over and over again is I see men who are in um, these relationships, and they stalemate and just block everything. And the woman gets more and more uh, hurt, and things dissolve more and more. And after the break, I'll talk about some of the situations I've seen and how to deal with them uh, in terms of how do you Im impact something like that and what can you do to move it, if anything. All right, we're talking about emotional abuse. Uh, Patrick Doyle's in the house. If you want to join us, you're welcome to call in at 776-5368. You want to remain anonymous, we'll respect that request as well. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Paulina and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're talking about emotional abuse, and this is a very big, big topic, and uh, we're going to try our best to at least cover the big areas of it uh, uh, today, and you're welcome to join us. The phone number is 776-5368. Patrick Doyle here from Veritas Counseling, and you, you touched on so many things there, um, <laughs> and I just want to kind of set the stage a little bit of an even playing field. Okay. Women can be abusive, too. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because I, I want to... Right. I realized in counseling, mm -hmm. the woman usually comes in first, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that sets the, the stage. Right. You know, very often, or very mm -hmm. uh, hardly at all, I should say, will you get a man that comes in and says, my wife's abusing me. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but it does happen. It does. Okay. It does. All right. Let, let me take a call here, and uh, we'll kind of work this in as we go throughout the, uh, the, the show today. Hi, ma'am. You're <laughs> on the air with Patrick. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, you're on. Go ahead. Um, my name is Mary, and Patrick, I wanted uh, you to also address how the Church unknowingly can align with the abuser and participate in the abuse, yeah. and I'll take the answer off the air. Okay. Wow, that Excellent. is loaded. Well, but she makes a very good point. Yeah, and she does. And I've seen this a million times, really, to be honest with you, over yeah. the years. Yeah, because they I, don't want to upset public opinion. Yeah, and it's really yeah. a fear-based approach, <clears throat> uh, rather than a faith in God approach. Yeah. Um, listen, if you if someone's having this kind of difficulty in their marriage with a man, if we encourage them to go back, which is what overarchingly to, to be more loving, to, to to you know cook them better meals, to you know, mm. more sex, you know, whatever, that that'll solve the problem. <clears throat> it will not solve the problem. And what you do when you give that advice is that you create a worse and deeper um, denial in the abuser. Mm -hmm. So, you know, historically I've set up programs around here for domestic violence and those programs always address the physical side of it. But I will tell you, hands down, every woman I've ever talked to says that they'd rather be hit than be emotionally abused secretly. And so as a church, one of the things I see, what we don't want to do, and, and I'm, you know, God bless pastors, I, and I, I'm not trying to be harsh, but mm. this is just what I've seen. We're more willing to confront the victim who's being hurt and as a woman than we are to confront the man who might get upset and cause a problem. 
and I see it time and time again Why? because it's a, it's a lot harder to look a guy in the eye who you think's out of control. And listen, he's got a good look good. He's, he doesn't, it's hard to find the crack. But part of, that, part of that stress is how do you know that what the woman telling you is mm -hmm. 100%? It, it doesn't have to be 100% for me. Okay. If, you're wa if your wife is so distraught that this is going on, you got a problem. Okay. And if you come in and tell me you don't, that tells me you're, you're the problem. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Well, I told you it wasn't going to be easy. Hi, so, ma'am. You're on the air. Go ahead. What's your question? Hi. Um, so my question is when a wife recognizes that she's scared of her husband and she begins to walk this path, because I've heard Patrick Doyle talk about this before, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the practical continuing to interact and be a wife? Right. Well, you know, without, without some clear um, support for you, it, it'll be really hard for you to maintain that because you're in, a, you're in, a, in a, what I call a one-down position. You don't have the power, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to have some support that's healthy that you can continue to go to as you walk through this because in your, in, from the position of the person who's being wounded, you're going to go through all kinds of doubt and um, fear about what's going to happen and am I, is this really right and you know they're, they're in one ear telling you you're crazy and this isn't right and you're just overreacting in the other ear you have the Holy Spirit saying you know no you need to press on no this isn't okay no you need to deal with this is that accurate yeah that's exactly where I'm at I don't know how to walk this path. right so that's why you need solid support outside the system who can hear what you're saying and help you be confident that you're in the right process because as people, what we want is when we make a decision to do something, we want pretty instantaneous results. Do yeah. you, are but, you? But in this case, you're not going to get instantaneous results. It takes time. And prob, in terms of probability, the probability of somebody in that much denial changing is lower than then they won't. But the most loving thing you can do is bring this into the into the fray. Bring this truth into the fray. Look, this is unacceptable to me. I'm not going to be treated this way, and we have to deal with this. That is the most loving thing you could do for the man who's doing this. And that's the part I want people to understand. The most loving part of this is to confront it. Jesus would confront sin. He wouldn't let it go on unabated. And so what you're told is it's wrong and bad to create conflict. And I think if you look at Jesus' life, what you see is conflict was part and parcel to telling the truth in love. Um, Make sense? Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And I'm ready to do that. I just don't know where to go to find that support and that help to know how to you know, do the day-to-day. -day who, who knows your situation? Mm -hmm. God. Okay. okay, so one of the things I would suggest is that you, you have to find some place safe to talk about this because one of the things that you have to do is because you've been in a situation where you're confused, you have to get some clarity before you can really step forward. Okay. Otherwise, you're too easily turned back. And so you need somebody to help you understand what's going on with you, help you process your own emotions, help you get some stability, and that will help you do the day-to-day -day way more effectively than being overwrought every day. Do you trust anybody at your church? Um, yeah. yeah. Let me, well, that was a weak yeah. So you, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, well, that man, I think... Uh, that, that, um, you may want to give Patrick a call when you're yeah. done, okay? Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, but you've got to find some place that you feel safe. And listen, safety is earned, not granted. Somebody has to prove their safety by their behavior, not their words. Yeah, and I think he's willing. I just have, unfortunately, gone back so many times, mm -hmm. keeping everything smooth and comfortable, and we don't make forward progress. Okay, so here's one suggestion I would have in the process of you working this out, is I would sit down, I'd get away from the house, I'd take some time away, and I'd sit down and I'd just, I'd, I'd get out a piece of paper or whatever, type it, whatever you do, and I would go through and write down the things that you believe are troubling you, the things that you see are the issues, get it all out on paper, okay? And that process in itself will help you sift and, and find out where the real issues are. And then, once you do identify somebody who's safe, I would take that to them and say, this is what I really feel like I'm feeling, and this is what I think is going on, so that you can get validated or helped to see what's going on. 
Because the problem in your situation is there's so much confusion. Yeah. Did right? I did I hear you say uh, in a, in an essence that you and your husband have talked about this before? Um. Yes. Okay. So he's aware of the problem. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, he's aware that you're upset. Yes. Okay. Uh, give Patrick a call. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You bet. See, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's it in a whole nutshell. That's, right? It is. That is. And yeah. so here's, here's a woman who's married to someone, but they're paralyzed to be honest because they're fearful of the response. And they're fearful of the response because of what they've gotten over time. It's not because they're making that up in their head. Which is no change. Which is no change. Right. And so if somebody doesn't take responsibility, you're going to end up in an impasse. And listen, the biblical, the biblical re remedy for relational conflict is confession, repentance, <laughs> and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't have repentance and confession, you're not going to change anything. That's right. Yeah, and the Bible's very clear about that. By yeah. the way, that's what brings healing. It, it, exactly. We confess James our sins. Chapter five says that. Yeah. To All right. Hi, uh, Diane. Let's see if I can squeeze you in real quick. What's on your mind? Well, I was in a, an abusive relationship, and I was going to church, and the pastors would say, "This is." Psalms 31 woman, and this is how you're supposed to, this is what a good marriage is. But they would never go to the next part, which said, this is not a good marriage, this is what a good mar a bad marriage looks like, and if you're in this marriage, or you treat somebody like that, it's abusive, and right. you don't have to stay there. Mm -hmm. What I heard instead when I went to them is, well, maybe that's, God, where, that's where God wants you to stay. Right. I, I was, I, there was only one church that I went to um, where they actually said, Men, if you're treating your wives like this or your girlfriends like this, that's not okay. Yeah. And they, mm -hmm. the vice versa for the woman. Yeah. And the next week they had the woman up there and said, if you're, if you're doing this to your man, it's not okay. Right. Because, it, because here's the thing. Until we deal with the sin of, of mistreating another person, regardless of who's doing it, we're not going to make good progress. And we're certainly not living the way God intended. Listen, everybody's a sinner. So... Let's just cover that already. None of us are innocent. So if the Bible says I'm to confess my sins one to another, I'm sure that means my wife. And the reason why, and by the way, I'm celebrating 20 years of marriage on the 27th of this month. And uh, if you don't believe there's a God, now you should. <laughs> <laughs> because I've done enough to destroy that marriage. I've talked, I've done radio shows about my porn addiction. Listen, I had to confess to my wife twice about my porn addiction. I mean, I thought after the first time I was divorced and for sure the second time, but because of God's mercy, and my wife said very clearly the reason why she didn't leave was because of my conviction. She saw that I was broken about it and that I was gonna change. And I'm guaranteeing you, if, if a person sees your brokenness and you're convicted, they will move toward you, okay? But if a woman's in a relationship where a man's never convicted, you can't expect them to be intimate. And if you're telling them to be, you're hurting everybody. Yeah, great stuff. And so we have to have the backbone and the will to confront the sin. And I think that's the point you're making, and I appreciate it, which is that as a church, a lot of times we just we just chump out on it. It's like it's like abuse is the bad word in church and we won't speak of it, you right. know? Yeah. No one wants it's, to no one wants to get involved with this. I mean, it's an ugly thing. And I really I really say this and I, I mean this. If if you're not interested in doing it, don't. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. Refer, defer to people who are interested and have the will and the desire to be neck deep in this stuff. Otherwise, you're just going to make it worse by piddling around in it. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. Well, Thanks. The other, the other thing I wanted to say is that when you're in an emotionally abusive relationship, is they dictate every relationship with you, at least in my experience. Yeah. And that includes the relationship you have with God. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. All right. Thanks, Diane. Okay. Uh, wow, it's loaded. Uh, seven seven six five three six eight. I think our callers are making the points there today. And if you have any questions or comments, if you want to call us and remain anonymous, we'll certainly respect that. Seven seven six five three six eight. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dan, and I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and LA, Medford might be considered a small market, but at the Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community and you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368.
All right, we're talking about emotional abuse and uh, big topic. Uh, Patrick's with us today from uh, Veritas Counseling. The phones are lit up, Patrick, and I think okay. our callers are making the point. Yes. So let's just go back to the calls this morning and see what's going on. Hi, Betsy. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Patrick. Go ahead. Hi. I appreciate this topic. Um, I grew up with an abusive sister, and I never recognized it until many, many years afterwards. And I, I'm a fixer. Mm. I would like it fixed, our relationship, and uh, how do you get the other person to recognize their behavior, or is that a possibility? The only way to get people to recognize their responsibility is pain. What do I do? Go down and torture her? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, no. No, what you do is no, you... No, 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 no. You, you didn't hear that here. <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to set some relational boundaries, and those boundaries of the loss of relationship, are you changing how you react, interact with her, is the pain and the discomfort that will bring the subject into focus. Now, because you set a boundary does not guarantee somebody will change, but what it does guarantee is your safety. Well, I've already done that, and uh, she's, she's very good at stonewalling. And, uh, and so then you have to wait that out. Now, the other thing I would do is I would encourage you to pray for God to bring about conviction in her life. Because, listen, until that happens, there's no real healing. No one gets better but without conviction. <clears throat> and so that's not something you or I can control. The only thing we can do is be loving and clear. Right, And lo when I say loving, I mean you're not going to hurt me anymore. I'm not going to let you get away with that. You, you cannot treat me that way, and it's wrong. And you saying that is the most loving thing you can do to them, and God may use that difficulty to bring about His conviction. But, you know, we have any guarantees. And, yeah. and the thing I don't want you to think is that if you set a boundary that everything will get better, chances are if you set a boundary, the first thing that person's going to do is get irritated. Is your sister aware of her uh, behavior? No, and um, her neighbor told me one day that he thought she was the meanest person he'd ever met. Right. Which is, you know, a, a very sad thing. It's very and sad. How about boundaries of, with a letter? Yeah. One of her best friends told me a terrible story about, you know, them trying to help her, and then she uh, reacted by saying, you've invaded my space, you know. Right. <laughs> Anyhow. So, uh, and so I, I'm 400 miles away, so I'm relatively mm -hmm. safe. Good. The other thing I would say is this, is that just, just, just for people to understand, we have a saying in counseling, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. Underneath your sister's anger and defense and, you know, porcupineness is really probably a profound level of hurt. And so she, she relates to people in what we call a self-protecting, relating style. She relates to people in such a way that keeps them away because she actually has a profound amount of hurt. And if we can ever get to that, we can maybe make some progress. But again, I really believe that's a spiritual level event. It's yeah. not so, something we're going to crack through the mind. Yeah. So if we ever did talk again, if we ever have a conversation, yeah, would it be appropriate for me to say, Elaine, uh, did you have something really sad going on in your childhood? I mean, that I didn't ever see. I would say something like, you know, I wonder, you know, I experienced a lot of hurt when, I, when we were younger. I just wonder if you did and see where she goes with it. Yeah. Uh, she did tell me she always thought she was adopted. <laughs> so I so don't know. I don't know what that means. Ask the Lord to give you some wisdom on this, Betsy. That's really, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and, that's really important, Betsy, because what she's yeah. saying is she feels abandoned. Yeah. Thanks. And that's profound. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, let's go to Susie. You've been waiting. Uh, what's your question and comment, Susie? Oh, hi. Hi. Am, am I on? You're on. Okay. Um, well, I was, I was uh, manipulated and controlled for years and didn't realize it, but knew I was miserable and mm. tried to talk to my husband about it a couple of times, you know, that we needed counseling. And within a half an hour, he would have me crying and begging him not to leave me. I mean, that's how controlled he, he was. Yeah. And um, my situation was different because there was really nobody I could talk to because my husband was actually the pastor of the church. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there was nobody I could go to because if I tried to talk to somebody, I would be, um, I would be like stabbing him in the back or right. something. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. I, just, I just felt miserable, and I didn't know what mm -hmm. to do. And mm -hmm. my comment now, and, you know, years have passed. We're divorced now. Mm -hmm. I found out, at, you know... 
in the process of separation that he had abused my children. And after that, mm-hmm. I felt like I couldn't go back to him. I felt like that was the worst betrayal in the world. Right. I felt horrible because I didn't know what was even happening. I felt like the worst mother in the world. Right. And every time I tried to talk to him, everything was always my fault. I wasn't praying enough. Mm-hmm. I wasn't supporting him enough. I needed yeah. to be a better wife, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And my question is, all through all those years of misery, I mean, I was so miserable, sometimes I'd catch myself praying that on his way home from a trip he'd die in a car wreck or something mm-hmm. so I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. And yeah. after that didn't happen, then I started praying that I would just be the one to die because I was so miserable, I just wanted out. And mm-hmm. to me, getting a divorce was like the worst testimony I could have for my family. Yeah. And it was a terrible thing. I mean. Mm-hmm. When when we would have a discussion at home, he'd say, oh, are you talking about the big D word? And then he'd grab my kids, and he'd bend down, and he'd put his arms around him. He'd point at him and say, she's the one. She's the one causing the trouble. I mean, that's just how bad it was. And yeah. he would never... He would never acknowledge anything. Yeah. So what you, you know, and I tried my best to, you know, to be the best wife and, and mother I could and to be the best pastor's wife I could. But my, my main thing is right now I just I still just feel so hurt and I'm thinking, Where was God? How come he never intervened? How come he never helped? I just feel betrayed and I feel like my whole my whole life has been nothing but a lie. Yeah. Well, I totally understand how you feel, and I, I get what you're saying. And listen, I strongly believe that even though it's very painful, there is redemption in this. Now, I would also say this. I know that on multiple occasions, your spirit was telling you, the Holy Spirit was telling you, something's not right. Something's not right. But you were prevented from having any resolution by a man who is a liar who is in profound denial and who is probably, from what I can tell, if he's abusing his own kids, probably evil. Yes. Very. And so the system that was set up around, and this is a, this is a much bigger problem, maybe a, a radio show for another day, but the system within the church is in, in this way many times very broken because you were trapped and you didn't feel like you had anywhere to go. And the system of that uh, church was helping you s- stay there. What, what would happen if you went and told somebody that your husband was mean? They would have told you that one time. I had like this elderly counseling person that used to be in counseling in the church, and I went and said, "Can I talk to you for a minute?" But I don't want you to. I don't want this to alter your opinion of my husband because I know you respect him. But I need to talk to somebody. And she goes, "Oh, sure, sure. Nothing you can say will ever make me do that." And I talked to her for about like a half an hour, and she never came back to the church again. So listen, I think that your, your testimony about your husband's behavior should change my opinion of him. If somebody's being evil, it should change my opinion. Oh, I thought he was a good man. He's not. Okay, we need to deal with that. That's what I'm talking about, love. We need to get involved. Your husband needed somebody to come in there and say, dude, you're out to lunch. You're, you're in a bad way. You're in trouble. You need to pull up before you hit the houses. You know, <laughs> stop. That would have been loving. This is what I see over and over again within our, the ranks of the Christian church. We don't deal with this difficulty. We let it fester and fester and fester. And then what happens is you end up divorced, all these evil things happen, and then you feel like your, your, your life is wasted. But listen, I want to tell you very clearly, God never wastes anything. Now, I know it was evil, and I know it was hard, and I know there's a lot of pain still. You probably look at your kids and still feel pain. But listen, you're not the one who did the evil. Not only right. that, Susie, um, I think your biggest recovery just happened within the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah. What you just shared has impacted thousands that are listening. It's true. It's true. And in that vulnerability, uh, God is using you. And I've always said whatever God has saved you from or has brought you through right. will usually turn you around and make you a minister too. Yeah. So as you continue in your recovery, don't be surprised that God uses you in ways you never thought. Yeah. Wow. And your testimony today, like Perry said, is helping many people. Um, your story is very common. I, I wish I could say that wasn't the case, but it is very common. And uh, I've gotten lots of requests over the years and just recently from people outside of this area to do a show on this because of the, the, the prominence of the issue, but the secrecy of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, it's, it's still just like a terrible thing because... I'm trying to get over it. I'm asking God to use me and give me a ministry, and 
I just so like I'm on the shelf. And, you know, for years and years I was a pastor's wife. I yeah. taught Sunday school. I had a role to play. All of a sudden now I'm nothing. No, you know what I'm saying? That, that, My identity was... No, time out. Time he's, out. He's using that, it. That's a lie. Yeah. Your value has nothing to do with what you do. Yeah. Your value, your God's va your value in God's eyes is is the result of what uh, His work on your behalf. You you can't be more valuable or less valuable based on what you do. That's another lie that we deal with as humans. But listen, God loves you profoundly, and He loved you so much He got you out of that abusive, abusive situation. Yeah. I would say, Susie, uh, take time to read Psalm 91 and let it be a prayer over your own life and that of your family, mm. and just relax. God is using you, and mm -hmm. He did tremendously today. Mm -hmm. I got, okay. I got a well, scoop. Thank you. All right. Let me take a quick break. We'll be right back. Alex, thanks for waiting. And other people who are waiting, we'll get to you as quickly as we can. Uh, Patrick Doyle's in the house. We're talking about whew, emotional abuse. <laughs> we'll be right back.